And it's not a Christmas message. I worked for two days on a Christmas. I got all kind of Christmas messages. As a matter of fact, now when I travel, I go somewhere like when I go up to uh, Oklahoma, uh, I know that the pastor and the church that David's going to be involved in and Tony, I've already took a zip drive and, and put about 50 sermons on it to give it to that young pastor just to help him out. Uh, I'm just starting to do that more and more. I've done it to a couple in California and uh, Pastor Jimmy, I gave him some. Because I can't get around to preach at these other places, but I have, this was, this was, when I graduated from college, you, you, you got to understand it was in 1986 that I graduated. So during that time, you didn't get a, you got cross pens. Y'all remember the cross ink pens, little skinny gold pens? You'd get cross, somebody give you a pen for graduation or they give you a tie. The greatest gift I got was a word, a word. A pastor wrote down on a card and handed it to me, and uh, I'd known him a long time, and I'd preached for him back in the day over in uh, Sabinaw, Texas, and the word was this, the Lord is going to give you sermons beaten out of the anvil of experience. That was the word. And I thought to myself, I don't like that at all. <laughs> I don't want sermons beaten out of the anvil of experience. And then next thing I know, after 40 years of preaching, my whole life's been about experiences I've had. And I share them with you through the Word of God. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is going to send out his disciples. And I thought of this today, and I thought, you know what, I want to say something that, that will relate to the Clowers family, but also relate to you about sending out. See, some people went, some were sent. And I think about the ones that Jesus sent, they were fishermen. This was a whole new experience for them. And he's going to give them this instruction about this day. Now, here's the wild thing. This was over 2,000 years ago. It's during pagan wickedness. Uh, nobody knows who Jesus is really at this time. The king has come to earth. Amen. And he wants to share about the kingdom. We're, we're back to that now. We are actually have gone all the way back, we're in a nation now that is uh, turning very quickly pagan, uh, anti-God, anti-Christian. We've seen it in our government, and now we're back to it. And I'm excited about it because the opportunities to share the gospel now are greater than they've ever been. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, he called unto him his 12 disciples. I want you to put yourself in their feet this morning, in their, in their sandals, and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He, he laid hands on him and said, guys, listen, if you pray over something, it's going to happen. So he tells them to go out to cast them out, to heal all manner of disease and all manner of sickness. And he said, now the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, there was Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother. There was James and, and the son of Zebedee and his brother, John. I always called him JJ. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican. Matthew, when it says publican, actually means IRS. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaan, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and charged them. He gave them orders. And he said to them, Go not into any way of the Gentiles. Don't go to the Gentiles. And enter not into the city of the Samaritans. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We're going to talk about, because some people will say, Well, why, why wouldn't Jesus allow them to go to the Gentiles or the, the people that were not Jewish? We'll talk about it. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out demons. Freely you receive, freely give. You get, you got it, now give it out. And this is what I always think of David and Tony, that the Lord blessed them. Freely they received a lot of stuff, and they always freely given back out of who they are. Amen. So he said, don't take gold. Which tells me of the 12, they had money. He said, don't take silver. Don't take brass in your purses. Brass. In other words, don't take no bullets. <laughs> Put your gun up. No wallet for your journey. Don't even take a wallet. Neither two coats, nor shoes, nor staff, for the laborer is worthy of his food. And into whatever, in other words, when you go somewhere, I, I'm believing they're going to feed you and look after you. And into whatever city or village you enter, search out who it is worthy. Who is it that will listen? And there abide till you go forth. Stay with them. And as you enter, now this is, this is to me when I'm reading this, I'm thinking, if it was me, I would be a little bit nervous about going out because I've been fishing, but now you're sending me into places I've never been and telling me just, 
to go and knock on, knock on doors. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it not, let your peace return to you. Oh, and whoever, whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words as you go forth out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly I say to you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. The fact that Jesus brings up Sodom and Gomorrah because of the issue of the destruction of the place and how the people thought then and the actions in the town. And listen, the, of course there was homosexuality in Sodom and Gomorrah, but there are also people that were overfed and underconcerned. You got to understand that. And that's what happens. You get overfed, you get unconcerned. You don't care. You don't care anymore. And that's a terrible place to be in. You know, in my life, uh, and I hope this is not true, but I expect to die probably in my bed or uh, perhaps the Lord to take me in some fun fashion. You know, and whatever he decides, I'm cool with it. But to, I also believe, though, that my successor will probably die in jail because this is how fast this thing is speeding forth. It's getting more and more wicked. You say, Pastor, you got, no, I've been doing this for 30, 40 years now, and I've seen the world start twisted. And probably the successor of my successor will die a martyr and will be killed for the sake of Jesus. Amen, because of the love of God. And I know we, it's hard for us to fathom that, but I'm seeing a twist in government and twist in, in wickedness, and things are not going to get, we're going to get better, but the world's not going to get better. We're going to be salt. Amen. We're going to be light, but we're going to see things start twisting in a different way. See, there are three stages of a moral revolution. Look at this. First, what was condemned is now celebrated. Back, what was condemned is now celebrated. What we used to condemn, what we actually had laws against is now celebrated. Now, what was celebrated is now condemned. Hmm. Christmas is now condemned. In the name of Jesus is condemned. Church is condemned. Amen. Doing the things to reach. And those refusing to celebrate are condemned. You have to celebrate with them. You've got to tell. This, this whole pro. Listen, the worst subject. I don't even know how I got through high school and college. My worst subject is English. I don't even know what a pronoun is. Therefore, I, I get messed up when I get around people. I go, well, they say, well, my pronoun. I don't care. What, what's your name? If you got hair on your face, you're a man to me. I see Adam's apple. Can I get an amen? I mean, it's, it's just how I look at things. So there's no question a purging of right thinking is underway. The dissenters in the recent Supreme Court have already said that. It's, it's not a surprise. So when I read Matthew 10 and I hear Jesus saying, I want you to go out, and some people aren't going to receive you, today they, they actually use the term a neo-pagan nation. In other words, we've become pagan again. We're post-Christian. We were Christian, and now we're not as Christian. As my daughter has been traveling around the world, she's seen places turning more Christian, and America's going the opposite way. Which means we become a little more apathetic, a little overfed and underconcerned. So we stand where the first band of brave young believers stood. The earliest Christians faced a world that was pagan, idolatrous, immoral, superstitious, and spiritually restless. So when Jesus says in Matthew 10 to his men, I want you to go out. Here's my orders. And I believe that God has given again uh, Pastor David and Tony orders to go. He's given us orders. And the word of the Lord is simply, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the good news. I love the good news of Christ. And there are reasons why we should never be ashamed. First off, Jesus has called us. He's called every one of us to go. He's called each and every one of us. You say, I ain't knocking on doors. That made me look like a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon or something. No, there ain't nothing wrong with you going over and re reaching your neighbor. Why did he send them just to, the, the, uh, to Israel? Why did he send them just to the Jews? And he said, don't take, a per don't take your gold, don't take your clothes. Just take a suit of clothes. My son, my youngest son, flew out to Chicago this week on Tuesday. He came into my office. He said, Dad, I'm gonna take me to the airport. And I said, why? He, he works uh, in the plants and he makes good money and he said take me to the airport I said well I'll have uh, your, your older brother take you and uh, and I looked at him I said Judah where's your bag he said I don't I don't need a bag where's your you're, oh, you're going in just your clothes you got on you got a hoodie on it's cold in Chicago he said that ain't gonna be that cold I said where's your toothbrush and he said, I, I, I got one somewhere. I said, There's, you left one in my truck. Take it. 
Put it in your pocket. They take your toothbrush. I get my truck. He's gone. Toothbrush still in my truck. He flew to Chicago on Tuesday just to eat a hot dog and, and a, a Chicago-style pizza. Ride around, see where the bulls play, the bears play, went around and met all kind of people, talked to them, flew home on Friday. And I thought to myself when I'm reading this, this is exactly what Jesus is talking about. Just go to the people you have influence on. Go to the people that you know. In other words, you're just going to the villages and the towns. Go to, I'm going to send you later to the Gentiles. I'm going to send you later. You're going to see me meet the Samaritans. I'm going to go through Samaria. You're going to see all that. But right now, this is your first assignment. Reach your family. Reach your friends. Reach your neighbors. Reach those that are just around. Don't, don't, think, don't be thinking about going way off. I often ask people, I even asked Jill this, are you called to a geography? Jill's the one, my daughter who's going uh, for five months, and thank you for helping us raise money to help get her out of here. But uh, uh, I even took her to another church on Wednesday. I, I'm desperate to get her gone. Uh, so, but the issue here is, I said, are you called to a geography or a people? See, Paul was called to Macedonia. He knew he was called to a, a location. I'm called to, to uh, southeast Texas. I know I'm called here. God put me here. Uh, somebody had to reach the folk here. This is where God put me. I feel that in my heart. I've always felt that. So when I look back over Scripture and I see uh, where David and Tony are going, that God's sending them back to family to reach back. See, many times we want to reach way out there and get those. We think that's so adventurous to reach way out there. And God's saying, listen, stay close to home. Take care of those around you first. Connect with them first. So Christ has called them. He summoned the 12. It was Peter. Amen. It was Andrew. It was James and John and Philip and Bartholomew and Thomas and Matthew, even the tax collector. And when Jesus chose these men, he didn't pick famous people. Matter of fact, Jesus chose men who were not popular. They were not well known. They didn't have a, a, a lot of Facebook hits. Nobody was hitting like. He chose ordinary, average men who were mostly from Galilee, which meant they tended to be blue-collar guys. They were hard workers. Jesus knows the weakness of these men, and he called them anyway. He called these men. He knew that James and John were impetuous, that they'd call down thunder. He knew that they would fire off. You ever been around somebody just fires off? You know that if you hit the wrong button, they're going to fire off. That was James and John. You hit the wrong button, they're going to call, fire down from heaven. Burn them up, Lord. Burn them up. Crispy. Crispy cream them. That was them guys. He knew Peter would deny him, but he chose Peter anyway. He knew that Thomas would doubt him, but he brought Thomas in anyway. He knew that Simon was a revolutionary. He brought him in anyway. He knew Judas was going to betray him, but he brought him in anyway. So why so many characters had serious flaws? Why is it that the disciples had so many serious flaws? I'm going to give you the answer. That's all God has to work with. And when he works with us, that's all he's got to work with. People with a whole bunch of flaws. Listen to me. The perfect people are in heaven. That's where they're at. The only ones on earth are the folk with serious weaknesses. The talent pool here has always been a little thin when it comes to moral perfection. So God said, you know what? I'm going to take you anyway. I'm going to take it and I'm going to change it. And God works with us unbelievers so much so that that's all he has to work with. In heaven, in heaven, in heaven, vastly perfection. Amen. Everybody, I believe everybody has gone to heaven are perfect now. They're mature now. They're cool now. Everything's good now. New bodies now. The truth is, both encouraging and frightening, it ought to encourage us that Jesus would call in perfect people. That means we qualify. But when he calls us to go without knowing what tomorrow will happen, war and words be said, faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but obeying in spite of, heaven, of consequences. In other words, I don't know what the consequences are going to be. I don't know what the consequences are going to be for you guys, but you've got to obey God. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they obeyed God, ended up in a fiery furnace. Amen. God got them through it. Didn't take them out of it, brought them through it. Daniel in the lion's den, put him in it. Amen. In spite of, in spite of. So I'm just going to obey no matter what the consequences are. It's the second reason I would tell you when Christ equips us and sends us out and gives us orders, he has equipped us. Matthew 10, verse 5, don't take the road leading to, the, to other nations. Don't enter any Samaritan town. Instead, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, announce this, the kingdom of heaven has come near. In other words, the king has come to earth. 
He's here. And we're going to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with skin diseases, drive out demons you have received free of charge. Now give back free. Don't take gold, silver, or copper, or money belts. Don't take a traveling bag on the road or an extra shirt, sandals. Just, just go the way you are. Right up front, we run into that usual commandment, don't go to the Gentiles. And again, the reason why is he wanted them to reach their sphere of influence. Now listen to me. Wherever the gospel goes, burdens are lifted. Wherever the gospel goes, burdens are Who built the clinics? Who built the hospitals? When I go to the hospital, I go to Methodist Hospital, St. Luke's Hospital, Presbyterian Hospital. When this country was founded, it was the churches that were building the hospitals. It was the churches building the clinics. Who built the orphanages? It was the church that done that. Who cared for the widows? It was the church. Who cared for the dying? It's the church. Who loved the unlovely? It was the church. Who brings gifts to kids? It's the church. It's the kingdom of God. That's why it's so important. The followers of Jesus said all these things because our master sent us out into a world to help hurting people. Freely you receive. Now give. This season is about this season's about giving. This season is about giving. giving. Amen. Releasing. So here, I believe the whole Christian life can be summed up in just six words. From God to us to others. Yeah. Pretty simple, isn't it? We get something from God to us to others. So what starts with God comes down to us in a torrent of grace and mercy. Have you ever been forgiven? Then forgive. Have you ever found mercy? Show mercy. You ever received a blessing? then bless others. Just take what God has given you and give it away to somebody else. You know, when Jesus called you, yeah, it was, it's, a, and when you got born again, and if you're here today, and I believe that those that are here today have been called of God, and all, and this all goes to us. When he calls us to do something, first off, I had no idea when I got born again that he was going to start asking me to do stuff. I mean, I'm reading the Bible, and I know God asked me to start giving, so I started giving. I'm reading the Bible, and I realized God told me to start witnessing. So I started sharing what God had done in my life. I actually read one place where he said, when I fast. He didn't say if I, he said when I. So I had to learn how to cut my throat and quit eating so dang much. Shut back. Why did I do that? Because it made me sensitive. It, 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 it sensitized my life. When I, when I wasn't stuffing myself with food, all of a sudden cha things changed. He, he told me to start praying, start talking to him. I'd never done that before, didn't know how. And people will go literally and take classes, learn how to pray. You don't have to take class, learn how to pray. All you got to do is talk to your father. Come on. Just talk to him. And, and, and it doesn't have to be in the church setting. It can be in a bathtub. It can be on a Harley. Amen. In your heart. Just talk to Jesus. Just talk to him. And then shut up and listen. Prepare yourself. <laughs> listen to me. When God talks to you and you say to you, here's how I always know it's God. I asked this question, would the devil ask me to do that? Ask the question, would the devil ask me to do that? You get a word that says, uh, go over and share with your neighbor, bring them some cookies. Would the devil tell me to do that? No, but God would. Go over and wash your car. Uh, should I get permission first? Y'all know I've mowed people's grass and I've done stuff for folk without asking. I've always had this idea that it's easier to get forgiveness than it is to get permission. That's really not a smart principle. <laughs> last, last one here. Jesus has prepared us. When you two came, you were, you were good. But after eight years and eight months, there's such a preparation in you. Sensitivity toward people. You're not as brass, David. You're not as, uh, you were, when you got here, you were a little bit sandpaper. A little bit. <laughs> and people would say, you know, he's a little. <laughs> I said, give him time. And then when the babies started coming, he got softer. <laughs> softer and softer and more patient dealing with life. And Tony, you've always just been sweet, but he's the one that needed help. <laughs> but God has prepared you. And I'll say, as your former pastor said, for what he has prepared for you. Matthew 10, 11. When you enter any town or village, find out who is worthy and stay there until you leave. 
greet a household when you enter it. And if the household is worthy, let your peace be on it. But if it is unworthy, let your peace return to you. You carry peace in every place you go. When you're a believer in Christ, you carry it into the hospital room when you walked in. You carry it into the school when you walked into school. You carry it into the clinic. You carry it into this house. You carry peace with you. There's something about you. You have an atmosphere about you when you walk into a place. And you need to understand that and realize that and own it. That when you walk in, there's going to be peace. I'm not chaos. I'm not somebody that's going to cause trouble here. I'm not here arguing with you. Amen. I came in here to bring peace into this house. During this Christmas, I pray peace in your home. Amen. That you bring, and that's what Jesus said. See, you, we never know how people will respond. So you go and you talk to them. And you don't know what they're going to do. So he said, I want you to go into those places, those, those little homes around you. Amen. And talk to them. We respond to others as they respond to us. You notice that? I always, when people talk to me, I respond to them versus how they respond to me. Amen. And, some, and here's the thing. Sometimes, believers, you are too nice. We're so nice because we're call, we called to be nice. Jesus, Jesus says something in here that blew my mind. He, he says, but sometimes you need to unbless those who do not wish to hear the good news. You're so uh, concerned about family. And friends or, fo or, or, or former friends who you used to know. And I'm going to share the God. But, Pastor, what if they don't listen? What if they don't hear me? Then shake the dust off your feet and find somebody who will listen. Amen. Connect with people who will hear you and love your Jesus with you. It doesn't mean you got to spit icicles at them. But here, literally, what Jesus is saying, when you go into a house, bless them. If they receive you, bless them. Bless you. When I bless you, listen, if you sneeze around me, I do not say, God bless you. It ain't in here. For me to tell you, God bless you when you sneeze. That's just, that's just a, a, a knee-jerk reaction that we've learned. And I ain't telling you not to say it. I think it's sweet of you. But my, I hold on to my blessing. I ain't going to bless you just because you blew snot out your nose. I hold on to my blessing. When I bless you, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to put my hands on you. I'm going to hug you. I'm going to shake your hand. I might put something in your hand. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to ask God to treat you well. I'm going to bless you. And a snotty nose ain't going to get a blessing out of me. My wife sneezed four times the other day in the car, and I didn't say a cotton-picking thing to her. When I want to bless her, I'm going to bless her. Can I get an Amen. So he said, when you go in the house, you give them blessings. You, you give peace to them. And, and you appreciate the fact they took you in and looked after you because I sent you. What, where's you? You ain't got no food. You didn't bring no water. No, I ain't got nothing. Jesus told me not to bring that. He told me to just show up here and tell you the king has come. The kingdom of God is now on earth. The, the deaf are hearing. The blind are seeing. The dead are rising. Amen. Just watch what Jesus is fixing to do. And he said, if they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet. When you leave that house or that town, unbless them. I'll never forget, I mean, years ago when I was a youth pastor, there was a young man named Thomas, and I talked to him about Jesus. He was a linebacker at Channel View High School, and I was talking to him about Jesus in, in the mall. Y'all remember the old San Jacinto Mall over there in Maytown. And I was talking with him, met, met him, and just witnessed and sharing the word. And he looked at me, he said, and they, they called me Brother Jerry. He said, Brother Jerry, I don't care if I go to heaven. And he got all bowed up and smart with me. I said, well, you don't care. You go to heaven, and you just go to hell. And I walked away. And I meant it. Go to hell. You don't want the blessing of God. You don't want my Jesus. You go to hell. That's where you're going. A couple weeks later, I'm in church, brag church, we call it, being radical about God. We're having church in the building, about 100 teenagers in there. And all of a sudden, at the altar time, I threw a tub down full of sulfur, big old uh, wash tub, and I threw a flare in that thing. Thing fired up, and sulfur filled the room. Kids were cold. <laughs> there was no ventilation, I didn't think. Gave the altar call, because hell's going to be a place of sulfur and fire. That young man came forward, looked at me, tears in his eyes. I said, what you want, boy? He said, Brother Jerry, I don't want to go to hell. I blessed him. He's still serving God today. Amen. See, there's something about sometimes just quit being so dang sweet to everybody. Tell them the truth in love. Amen. You know, the, the, the great...
prophet, Kenny Rogers, said, you got to know when to hold them <laughs> and know when to fold them, know when to walk away, and know when to run. Can I get an amen? Amen. Verse 15 says, I assure you it will be more tolerant. Listen to this. He said, if they do not receive you when you talk to them about me and the kingdom, it will be more tolerant, tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Wow. You mean when I share and they don't listen, it's going to be worse than it was at Sodom and Gomorrah. He put an emphasis on it. In other words, even though that town was destroyed because of homosexuality, or they were overfed, they were underconcerned. When you meet people that will not listen to the gospel, it's going to be worse for them now. I mean, this is what it's, what it's about. Light received leads to more light. The more you hear the word of God, the more light you get inside of you, the more light you have. Darkness is cheap. You ever notice how cheap darkness is? It don't cost nothing to turn on darkness. It's just cheap. It's the way it is. But darkness, light rejected leads only to darkness. So the more you reject light, the more you head toward dark. Hard times are coming. I, I, I love the fact that we're in a blessed time. We're in a good time. Pastor Mike and I talked about this morning. We're in a good time. Life is just good. Enjoy. But hard times are coming. I just see that on the horizon. I see persecution coming. Amen. I see families divided. As Scripture said, churches splitting, leaders disappointing, believers are marginalized. Amen. In the world. Uh, should we be discouraged? No. We're back where it all started. All the way again. It's a great sense. We've gone back to the first century, back to the early days of the, of the Christian movement. God's calling us back to the future as we get our marching orders from Jesus. When we saw Jesus' revolution, we saw how it affected the lives of people in the 60s and 70s. We're going to see th things like that happen. It's th good things are going to happen for the believers, but the world's going to get worse. And we got our marching orders. And they're the same today. They're the same today as they were in the beginning. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. Amen. Do not fear. You got angels on your side. Amen. You got great things coming. And, and I, I, I loved uh, uh, this statement. And I wish I'd have thought of it first. But we're on a mission for God. Amen. It's an exciting time. The harvest ripens before us. Some will hear and receive. Others are going to reject. And when they do, shake the dust off. Some of you get so concerned. They didn't listen to me. They don't like my church. Pastor, they don't like you. I know. Shake the dust. Keep walking. There are other people out there that are hungry. Amen. They want to hear your message. They want to get to know you. You're good people. Some of you are really nice. So the harvest remains plentiful around the world. In these great days, it's a great day to be a believer. If the night is dark, then remember the darker the night, the brighter the light. I'm praying that God shines on our hearts. Now listen to this again. First, Jesus has called him. When God brought the clowers here, he called them. When I sat with David and Tony for the first time, uh, I told them that I was Richard Golightly. Is that right? And uh, Richard was to be me. He's not a good actor. He's terrible. He couldn't, he couldn't pull it off for 60 seconds. Uh, but we, we tried to work it out because I wanted to see their reaction. And then once they realized it was me, they were happier. <laughs> he called them. He's called us. He's equipped us. Justin equipped us. He's given us everything we need to do the job that's ahead for us. Share the word. Pray and believe. And then he's prepared us. He's prepared us for what he has prepared for us. We've got a big task ahead in the next year. And so he said, well, who's going to take Pastor David and Tony's place? No one. You don't replace people. You say next one up. Who's the next one? Amen. Who, who's God going to bring up? And it's exciting to me to see who's going to be next. I actually told my pastor this morning, I, 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 I actually have, I don't have a desire to go deer hunting right now because Pastor David always skint the deer I killed. 
And Pastor Joseph was in the truck with me. He said, well, it may not be pretty, but I can do it. And I said, thank you, Jesus. We'll figure it out. Amen. Next one up. God's called us. He's given us a purpose. He's equipped us. Those 12 men went out, and it had to be a time when they were nervous. And Jesus just let them know, look, guys, if they don't accept you, if they don't receive you, it doesn't mean that you're doing the job wrong. You just got to share. Some folk ain't ready yet. They're not ready to hear it. What, what, what's going to get them ready? When they heard enough. When they heard enough, they'll remember your words. When they learn enough, they'll remember your words. Bow your heads for a moment. Father, I speak to a congregation of believers who love one another. I saw the love this morning. You've called us. You've equipped us. You've given us purpose. Help us in the next coming year to be reminded that first we got to go to our neighbors. First we got to go to the sphere of influence that we have. And we've got to share what the King has done in our life. I thank you for this house. We bless the folk here. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Give God a praise in here. If I can get our servant leaders to come up. Come on.